Hello, everybody, and welcome to a new interview from MinMax. MinMax is a place about games, friends, and getting better. This is an exciting one. I am Ben Hansen. I am here. I am joined by Kelsey Lewin. That's me. Kelsey, I know you as somebody who cares a lot about video game history. Uh, is this correct? This is very correct, yes. Okay, great. So thank you for being up for this when I reached out to you and I said, hey, um, I just got a weird pitch out of the blue from John Romero and Jordan Mechner, and they want to talk about preserving game history. Like my dream conversation? Yeah, this sounds fantastic. Yes, that's exactly what this is. So uh, it was sparked by the death of Game Informer and by Internet Archive uh, going through a ton of struggles lately. Their collection of digital books, it's going to get harder for them to lend those out digitally, which is an enormous loss. Very frustrating. So if you're a dork for video game history or you want to be a dork for video game history, uh, this is a conversation for you. I hope you all enjoy it. So obviously, Jordan Mechner, a legendary creator. We talked about him a lot on the Min Max Show podcast when we were pushing for the making of Karateka to be one of the best games of the year that it was released because it's an awesome interactive documentary. Obviously, the creator of Prince Prince of Persia, uh, Last Express, a ton more games in there. And then John Romero, co-creator of Doom, Wolfenstein 3D, Quake, Daikatana, uh, a ton there as well. And what unites both these folks is a lot of things, a passion for history. They both also recently got their story down in writing. John Romero with Doom Guy, Life in First Person, the book that he wrote, and then Jordan Mechner with Replay, Memoir of an Uprooted Family. These folks wanted to get out there and just talk more about the tricks to preserving game history, why it's important to preserve game history, the lessons they learned along the way, how it's important for other game developers out there, especially those in the retirement age of their careers to get that history down in some way. If you enjoy this interview, you can always subscribe to MinMax's YouTube channel. We have a ton more interviews like this. Hope you all enjoy it, especially ones that get multiple developers together. I feel like there's always a magic that comes from that that we can't offer. And if you want to help support independent games media directly, you can go to patreon.com slash MinMax with two ends. If you jump in at any tier, even that $2 tier before Monday, September 23rd, we'll DM you with a Steam code for Arranger the Role Puzzling Adventure, the brand new puzzle game. It's a really fun one with a great team behind it. And if you jump in at the $5 tier, you unlock the podcast version of this interview, all of our other interviews, The Deepest Dive, which is our game club discussion series, early ad-free access to the MinMax Show podcast, and a ton more. And without further ado, here is John Romero and Jordan Mechner. John and Jordan, welcome to MinMax, guys. Hey, how's it going? Hey, really well. I appreciate you all uh, making this happen. This is a surprising thing to get out of the blue. It's like, hey, uh, John Romero and Jordan Mechner want to talk about game history with uh, you and Kelsey. And it's like, this is extremely up our alley. So what what is going on? Jordan, did this come from you initially? Well, I mean, John's always been into game history. And John, you were the one who encouraged me to give my papers and... Uh, you know, work materials uh, from the 80s and 90s to the Strong Museum in Rochester. Yeah. It's an amazing place. It's unbelievable. If you haven't been there, oh my God. I still haven't been there in person, actually. <laughs> I've got all my stuff. <laughs> oh my God. I've looked through all of your stuff at the Strong Museum, and I didn't realize you have never seen it sitting there. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Yeah. Did you, did you, was it, New York. it was in the pullout? You know, it was in the, like, you have to separate the, the things and use white gloves and open up. They the brought it all out to me on a cart. It was like a full oh, part okay. of stuff. And the the thing that sticks out to me was you had like a fake beard preserved from The Last Express. And that w I was like, of all the things to save, I mean, obviously, you know, your, your journals and everything are the probably the most important part of history. But I was like, an entire fake beard. Okay. All right. Wow. This, this is great. It, really, it expanded my uh, my belief in what could be preserved for video game history. You know, and you I know, didn't even funny. know that. <laughs> what? Yeah, you didn't even know that was there. No, the, I think the last time there? I saw that stuff, it was being packed into boxes in my garage in L.A. If you're ever missing like wow. your car keys or something, there's a chance they're just at the strong as well. If it's just, a I, big, I think big there's head. a ticket to Disney World in there too, or Disneyland or something like wow. that. So if yeah, if you if you need the receipt for that, um, they've got it up at the strong. Yeah, <laughs> in I the '80s, when I was when I was working at Origin, one of the things I had to, that I I needed to do to do my job was um, I just built a cable that went between the Apple II GS and the Commodore 64, so I could just transfer data between them because I was doing a port. And the Origin Museum had that for years and years and years. And somebody has it now. <laughs> I don't know where it is, but my, my transfer cable that I built was was there. I mean, how surreal is this? I mean, this is there's a lot of 
topics we can tackle in this interview, but just the idea of like going to a museum and seeing your old Apple II, John, in the Strong Museum there. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's treating it like it's the Rosetta Stone. I think it's awesome. I think it's accurate. We should be doing that. But does it feel like you just want to pull the curator aside and be like, come on, this is ridiculous. It's just an Apple II. Or do you feel like, do you have the frame of history now and you also can appreciate from your perspective what they're doing there? I can, I can appreciate it um, because my Apple II hopefully is still next to Bill Budge's Apple II. <laughs> and that, that's the reason why I wanted the Apple II. That, that I was like, this would be amazing to have my Apple II here because Bill Budge's Apple II is here and he is the badass. And uh, in another Apple II to put next to that, that I actually have is Nasser Jabelli's Apple II that he used to develop his, his stuff at Sirius Software. So oh, wow. I have the other Apple II because because back then those two were so early in in developing their stuff that I was massively influenced in you know 1980 and 81 and 82 by what they were doing and so was everybody else um, that like for them to be in the strong was huge to me and the fact that Bill's Apple II was there and the, and I got Nasser's so I could get Nasser's in there the reason why Nasser's isn't there is because they don't have room for it yet. And I really want to have. I really want them to make that space so we can have have both of their Apple twos in there. That would be nice. So you convinced Jordan to donate all of his stuff to the Strong. So are you kind of a? Is this a life mission of yours, John? Is to kind of talk to other developers and be like, "Come on, chop chop, we got to start serving this stuff." I've d- I've done it to to several developers, and and and, and the thing is, um, I wouldn't have done that if I hadn't been there and seen it, and just the ex- massive amount of stuff that they have. And you can you, like all of their money goes into this and it is a massive building and they have so much stuff you can't even see unless you get a guided tour behind the scenes. The, the amount of stuff that they have available to pull out for show is like bigger than what they're showing. It's it's gigantic. I just have never seen anything like it. It's unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, and John, we've been doing this long enough that the early stuff that we did when we were kids is now like, you know, historical. It's old. Yeah, which, I know. <laughs> which, which, we, we, of course, are not. not <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Old, but the, so stuff, the stuff we did is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> but it's interesting that I have back here. <laughs> Hell yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Is that a weird feeling to be? Uh, I mean, when, when do you start to know that? you are a part of history and that, you know, I, I think this is something that, you know, but maybe for both of you, cause you both had very clear, massive commercial success. It was maybe a little bit of an easier decision, but like, I mean, as, as a developer in general, I mean, when do you realize that you are the history? We should say that, you know, when we were making games back in the day, it was physical objects, right? It was floppy disks and, you know, we would make sketches on paper. And so there are all these physical artifacts that resulted from that. So it's pretty easy to pack all of those work materials into boxes and ship them off to the strong. But at a certain point, things started getting more and more, uh, you know, just they existed on hard drives, uh, which had to be backed up and, you know, you know, server backups and then more and more stuff happening online and in the cloud. So it's kind of, I mean, at, at a certain point, I started to realize that the, like, I, there was less available for previous, like the games that I did in the 2000s. It's really hard to find any record of like the conversations or the sketches or, you know, the works in progress. I mean, we have that stuff for the 80s because it's on floppy disks. Right. But at a certain point, stuff becomes harder to find. And so like, maybe that's a good segue into like the thing that, sort of triggered, you know, John and me to sort of want to do this call. Uh, I mean, for me, it was uh, when you know, Game Informer disappeared uh, and, you know, a magazine, you know, closing down. It's, you know, it's sad. I love magazines. I mean, a lot of the print magazines like Soft Talk that I loved back in the day, you know, have had their wonderful run and then ended. But the thing that struck me about when Game Informer ended was that the website disappeared overnight. Yeah. So I, I would have loved to just... I was like, oh, yeah, I remember being interviewed 20 years ago. I, I saw, you know, this, like staff members, you know, editors of Game Informer, sort of, you know, on, you know, on social media, you know, sharing the memories. I was like, yeah, I remember being interviewed. I would love to. And but when I, you know, went online to find that interview, I couldn't find it. Yeah. It was gone from one day to the next. Now, so thanks to the Internet Archive and the, you know, the Wayback Machine and also the work that you're doing, 
you know, now with MinMax, it's uh, like that stuff is not gone forever. People who remember it, care about it, and are going to see that it's archived in some way or another. But I think we're in an era now where the default is that stuff disappears. You know, today's game development, the last decade or two of game development stuff, that stuff is all going to be forgotten and gone forever. If somebody, if the people involved, you know, and, you know, organizations, you know, like the Internet Archive don't really make an effort to preserve it consciously to say this is worth keeping. Let's curate it. Let's put it somewhere where it's not going to go away. And I think that's a really, you know, a great point that you're saying that it, it's also the Internet. The Internet Archive doesn't um, it, it doesn't just happen. You know, it's it's not like. The, the websites go up and then there's just a magical force that puts it on the way back machine. I mean, the, there is an actual archive team um, going out and doing the work to save that because, you know, the companies like like Game Informer, uh, <laughs> GameStop are, are not doing the work to save these things themselves. And um, I, I think that we've been we take that for granted sometimes. So there's just kind of this assumption that things will continue to exist um and that like it will it will make it up there somehow you know someone will save it and yeah the truth is if there's not someone um who kind of recognizes that ahead of time and is like we you know we need to be saving this before it disappears then i mean you can end up in a situation where it's just too late and we've lost you know internet forms are just I mean, that's a graveyard now. I mean, because yeah, it yeah. just wasn't it wasn't something that was easy to scrape or that people were prioritizing scraping. And so, I mean, you you can't get that stuff back. I have a dumb question um, as the history uh, naive person here. How does that work with the Internet Archive? Like so GameStop shut down Game Informer's site. The entire thing is gone, uh, which is just brutal. Um, and uh, so but we can use the Wayback Machine to find specific dates that have been saved. So it's the archive team scraping it on a regular basis throughout the years, or how literally is that happening that we have specific moments in time where we can kind of see traces of the history of the internet? I've never worked for archive team, but it is a a group of people um, almost entirely volunteer that, um, yeah, are just kind of scraping it on a regular basis. And there are browser extensions that can just kind of do it naturally for you. and you know capture all kinds of urls within a or like sub urls within a url um i'm not a horribly technical person so i may be butchering this slightly but um you know i I think that anyone who's interested in adding that extension and and helping um helping curate that i mean every bit of doing that and browsing helps um, but yeah, it, it's, it's a team of people who are just kind of adding these extensions and, and in some cases manually scraping them. Yeah. Jason and Scott does an amazing job. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, very much fear the day Jason Scott is gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause he does know tape, who, you know, he's saving tape even. I don't know who could possibly match his energy and passion and just absolute workhorse ethic, um, saving as much as he is. And who is Jason Scott? Yeah. What is he doing? Oh, man. he's, the, he's like the, he's like the leader of the digital archive. <laughs> internet archive. Team. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he's the guy doing the, the, the internet archive. He's having, you know, like truckloads full of stuff being delivered for scanning and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. That's nonstop. Yeah, we should, We should mention that in order for things to get into a digital form in the first place, at some point, it's a palette of like old newspapers from a local newspaper that's just, you know, gone out of print. Instead of going to landfill, like somebody has to pay for it to be shipped by UPS and then to take each newspaper and scan each page of the newspaper and create a digital version of that. Then the next step is to make sure that that's findable online, that it's, you know, it's saved somewhere. But if you don't do that first step, like those newspapers are gone and when they're gone, they're really gone. Yeah. Yeah. On, on the Game Informer front, um, I mean, do you all have, you, you've both been interviewed, I'm sure, dozens of times for Game Informer. Do you have any distinct memories of working with Game Informer in the early days, anything like that, the first time you encountered the magazine? Not me because I believe Game Informer is like mostly a console uh, games magazine and yeah. I am PC developer from the beginning (laughs) so i never i mean i would i've done interviews definitely with with them but but not like 
it's not something I did a lot. Yeah. It was mostly PC Gamer and CGW and stuff like that. For me, it probably would have been around the time of Sands of Time, like 2003, 2004. Right. Uh, because, you know, that was the first, you know, console game that I had, that I'd worked on. But uh, again, like I would have loved to call up that interview and, right. and, and reread it. And re I was like, oh, so yeah, he's uh, and, and sort of see, you know, what the journalist who interviewed me then, you know, had done since and just kind of, you know, send a tweet or or an X, you know, whatever tweets are called now and uh, and say, <laughs> hey, but uh, yeah, but it's just it's just yeah. gone. I, I, I'm hoping for the day that. Somebody can convince GameStop to change their mind to put that site up. It still drives me nuts that that thing has been taken down. It's like, for what? There's no... Yeah. How much could it possibly have cost to keep that well, site Well, there's up also... Anywhere? There's a magazine, too, right? right. And people are going to PDF those, like, 100%. Basically, every magazine has been archived. Right. So it's really worrying about the digital site, which is something that, if Internet Archive has been crawling it, that's some something that has to like without just leaving it in there. Somebody needs to pull that out. But that's such a massive undertaking because that thing changed constantly all day. Yeah. So that is huge. <laughs> I, I Compared to here's the print magazine, you know, it, it you know it's 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 to me um it's as as difficult as like trying to archive a Facebook game that is server dependent. Yeah. You know like. Those things are gone. Like when they're taken down by the by the publisher, the the whole thing is finished. You know that that nobody had a copy locally because it was always delivered through a browser. So those games are are done. And there's a whole topology behind the flash or whatever that was delivered to your screen. There's a whole server you know setup behind it, and that archival process still is not like finished yet either. Like you know, how are you going to archive uh, World of Warcraft? Yeah. You know, like you need to archive the topology of the shard and the servers and the authentication and login and everything. It's massive. But but I know that archivists have been working on that problem. Yeah. The World of Warcraft is actually one of my favorite examples because, um, I mean, because of A, everything you said, which already just sounds like a monumental work that's too much work. And then... 50 years from now, let's say all of that has been done and they really can just spin up, spin up a server very easily. But sitting in an empty Azeroth, are you really playing World of Warcraft, you know, or are you really yeah, getting the true experience? Um, and, you know, I, I'm going to segue a little bit here because uh, I think that the context and what these, you know, what Game Informer represents in you know, so many ways is the context around the games themselves. I mean, games, of course, massively important to um, to save, but without any of the surrounding context around it, um, you don't really understand the full story of that game. And uh, Jordan, you had something in your in your replay uh, graphic novel that your dad said that really stuck with me, which was about the the photographs that um, that your grandfather had, and you know, you were uploading them. Um, online and he was like well am i going to be able to comment on it because i mean just the photos don't mean anything like and it's the you know just an, an empty azeroth doesn't really mean <laughs> anything in the same way yeah, yeah re re replay the graphic novel memoir that you know that i wrote and drew that came out last year and john you just uh, did your memoir too which was wonderful yeah doom yeah, guy and, and so I, I guess we both like dug into our own pasts you know, and family stories <laughs> to, you know, to it, it, actually in a, in, in a way, uh, Kelsey, what you just said, it's like context. It's at a certain point, it's not just about saving, you know, the games or the code, you know, it's the stories, the human stories behind them, you know, the communities yeah. that were around them. And it's about, you know, as many people as possible telling their story. And like, that's something that's going to let like a, a new younger generation of gamers kind of, you know, Maybe like maybe twenty years from now they won't be able to go back and play World of Warcraft the way that you know we could then. But at least the, they they can hear what everybody said about it and see what's been saved. And and between those they can kind of you know in their imaginations sort of understand what it was. Yeah, well, like one of the the, the context you know examples a really important one. 
because any in, any kid would look at some game and go like that looks like crap. <laughs> that's our that's horrible. Like it's a twenty year old game. What a why who would who would want to play that? And the context is the the historical context is super important. One of the things that um, there's there's a couple books out. They're called the black the black book the black, uh, the game engine black book for Wolfenstein 3D. And there's one for Doom. And the first third to probably half of the book is setting the context of that exact time period when those games were developed, what the exact hardware was and what it could do at that time, and then explaining how it was used to do what we did. And that's like the best story is when you can actually exhaustively give context to like, here are the kinds of games that were out at this time. Here's the hardware everybody had in general. This is the the hardware that that these games were made on. And this is why, you know, what they had to do to actually make it do what it did. Yeah. Um, Which, you know, it's great to have that context, you know, because that tells a full story versus just the picture with no comments or this was when, you know, in 1954 and this is right after this happened. And, you know, Digital Eclipse is doing, I think they have a great model for how to tell the stories of old games because it's one thing to make a game playable under emulation today. But as John just said, to, out, out of context, you know, people today will look at it and go, you know, what's the big deal? I don't get it. Like, wh- yeah. why did anybody think this was cool? But to uh, uh, Digital Eclipse did, you know, with Atari games and, you know, they've just done one for Tetris. And, yeah. uh, you know, then they did one of uh, the making of Karateka, you know, my first uh, published Apple II game, which uh, John, is how you and I first met, but that's another story. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, that's awesome. That just goes to your all's like historically minded attitudes of trying to preserve this stuff. Cause there was the fan letter for, from John to Jordan that's in that making of Karateka. And it's so awesome that that's preserved. That's like, what are the odds that they would save this after all these years? I know it's crazy. It, it, unbelievably. This is like, I think I am just a born historian because back in at the very beginning of my like game development journey in in you know the earliest 80s when i i was so excited i i did so much stuff back then but but when i thought that i made something that was maybe good enough to publish or maybe someone would think that it was good enough to publish whenever i sent anything out i printed two copies i sent one and i kept one Whoa. so i I have the files still on copy, but I also have the heart of the, the printouts. And let me tell you, paper has outlasted everything. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And paper is amazing. You guys have set yes. the bar very high for uh, <laughs> preserving your stuff and keeping copies of, of things. Um, you know, Jordan, keeping a journal since you were 17 years old is ridiculous. So I think um, what yeah, kind of, what kind you, of... you've set a very high bar here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I did start keeping a journal when I was 17 and, you know, John was, yeah. you were 17 when you wrote me that letter in 1985. Yeah. Uh, and I still have my journals from back then. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think it was the second letter that I ever got, you know, from, oh, wow. you know, wow. from someone who played one of my games. So of course I kept it, you know, your, you know, the printout that said greetings, earthling at the earthling. top. And, and I, yeah, and I put <laughs> it in a shot. folder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, since you two just went through the whole process of kind of archiving your own history for your books here, like, I am kind of horrified that there aren't more autobiographies and memoirs and stuff out there uh, from game developers. You know, we got like Sid Meier wrote one, which is great. Yeah. Cliffy B wrote one, which is great. Uh, Kelsey, your uh, Mark Flitman, who you worked with uh, back at the Video Game History Foundation, like his, I think is just an important slice of history to get out there. But do you have just tips for other developers who are, Thinking about this, and just let me set the scene a little bit. Like, I remember I interviewed Mark Cerny years ago and brought up the idea of like, hey, Mr. Cerny, you need to yeah. write a damn book. You have one of the wildest yeah. perspectives on the entire game industry. And he just laughed it off. Like, no one wants to read a book about my life. Why would I ever <laughs> write that? It's like, what are we doing if not preserving your history? Yeah. My God. Exactly. Exactly. Like, I've done a lot of. Um, like oral histories at the computer, uh, the computer history museum, which yeah. is not even a game one, but it's just like preserving that information um, is is important in any context. Because yeah, you can go on YouTube and watch tons of videos and find videos and stuff, but like none of this is in one place. It's spread out all over the place, you know. Um, there's a cool there's a cool book. I don't know if, if any of you have heard of it. It's called Retro Game Archaeology. It's pretty expensive. It's like 75 bucks. 
but it's it, it it's a it basically breaks down classic games that are like on the NES in in actual assembly language, and and analyzes how the 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 features and systems turned into assembly and how they use the tricks of the 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 hardware to do what they did, kind of like the Doom and Wolfstein book I was talking about before, but for games like you know like a uh, Atari Adventure and stuff like that, retro game archaeology, um, okay. it's. It's almost academic, but it's it's really good. <laughs> Did you like call up a lot of people that you'd worked with and interview them? Just say, let's just talk oh, about. Oh yeah. yeah no, oh, I have I have so much video uh, that no one's ever seen before. Of like, I'd sit with Sid Meier for two hours and go over how he programmed the assembly um, for the rendering on the Commodore sixty four for like you know F fifteen Strike Eagle and stuff like that. Just kind of going back and forth about his development days. What he remembered about assembly programming, um, and it's like it's it's important to not like for this kind of stuff, someone who can do it, interview asking the questions that are detailed about it right. versus a journalist who can just talk about the game experience and and uh, the the effect and what the market was like all that, but like getting in there and talking about the actual code itself and how it was developed. What was your development environment? What 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 programs did you use to write this stuff, and what other tools did you write to be able to process the data to do this? And so I've done that with Don Daglo and Noah Falstein and you know a bunch of people. I have a bunch of video, I have tons of video, even from like the '90s uh, from the Apple II reunion that I had. Uh, Steve Wozniak and Joel Berez mm-hmm. and like Chris Chuck Somerville, uh, guy, you name it. I had tons of video, even like little piece from uh, Nasser Jabelli. Um, he was there, so I re- re- you know interviewed him. I have a three-hour interview with Nasser that that wow. I did put the audio up on my on my thing, but it is a full video one. What? Um, okay, I this have is a podcast time time warp. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, I get it. But like, how do we get that stuff out into the into the world? Um, I just have to find some time. <laughs> 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 All right, we can That's help. If you need I've, I've been there before. No. Yeah, but, and yeah. stuff like that is. I, I think there's a real, um, there's a real dearth of stuff like that, especially because I do think that you know we at least have throughout the years had we've had journalists this whole time, right? Like we've had magazines interviewing people about the games, and you're at least getting some of that down. And um, for a long time, some of it even on paper, which as you mentioned, is a lot easier to yeah. preserve than uh, than words on uh, on a screen. Um, yeah. but yeah, you don't get a lot of, um, you know, technical talks between, you know, uh, fellow builders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. It was just programmers talking programs. And, um, you know, that is the kind of thing that I think, um, is really at risk of being lost to history. Um, just a lack of understanding about why things were done the way they were, um, what the tools at the time looked like and why, you know, some things that, may come across as like little quirks or something where like just that was the only way it could be done. Um, yeah. 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 There was, there's, um, there was a guy that you can't find cause his name's Larry Miller. So have fun trying to track that person down. <laughs> the comedian. Um, he's incredible. He was an incredible programmer. He, he went on to co-invent the, the, uh, mechan- the, the, um, artificial heart. So he was a coder on the Apple II. And he he wrote a couple games and, you know, like he learned assembly and all this. This is in 1981. And he unbelievably that like this is a, a, this is a crazy, crazy story, really short. And I know the eyewitness who was there. Um, he came into the he came into the publisher when he was finished with his game. And is he can't he came in. He has a pipe it's like like smoking a pipe. A secretary comes in with them, and she goes over to the Apple II computer with a massive stack of of just handwritten notes, and she's the one that wrote them. So she has a shorthand for the assembly language that basically she, he. I mean, it was probably straight assembly, but she's the one who wrote it down because he just dictated the whole thing to her. Whoa. He just sat there with his pipe <laughs> and he dictated load the accumulator with immediate six. Store the accumulator at 300, uh, load the Y register. Yeah, and she, he did this for a full game that was 3D. <laughs> and 
I it's can't massive. even do talk to type. <laughs> <laughs> so he did the he did this somehow, I guess, in his office or something. And I mean, when we're talking a game, we are talking thousands and thousands of lines. So while he's at the publisher, she's typing all this into an assembler, and he's just sitting there, you know, just talking away <laughs> with Nasser and and Jerry Jewell and every and and you know Paul and so he's doing this and then it's like okay I'm done and it and it compiles or it assembles and then they ran it and it worked and the only thing that was wrong was that the um the score was backwards because of BCD <laughs> mode and his so there's that's he dictated he had the whole game in his head and he never looked at any of the code on a screen yeah he had it all in his head and he just dictated it and then she just typed it in. That that has never happened in history at a publisher. But I know someone who was there when that happened. That's <laughs> yeah, so wild. I mean, when you all are just looking at the, the history of the video game industry at this point, is it kind of that Apple II era that you feel like is just a black hole? Like, I know we talked about 2000s online games, and that's definitely an issue as well. But are you too frustrated by a lack of history and kind of that, that early scene? Mm, I Not really, because yeah. like soft talk was amazing at just preserving what was happening in the world at that time because it was not run by someone who was like a technocrat it was it was that that magazine was run by a human being and she was incredible and she she knew that some of the technology had a place in the magazine but it was about people and it was about the stories that people were telling while yeah, creating this brand new market you know and so Margot Comstock, she did such a great job with that. And, and there's a lot of the interviews in, with the company founders of the most important companies back then. And there's also been other efforts at, at interviewing these people, like it's dadgun, dadgum.com. Yeah, um, yeah. It's uh, Halcyon Days. And there's a bunch of really great uh, Apple II programmers that have been interviewed in, like in detail with technical questions and stuff. Nice. And... Um, you know, it's it's really great, you know, and, and so like Hackers was a really great book, right? Hackers, the last part of it, the hardware hackers with, with uh, Sierra and Origin being super detailed was amazing. And there's in, in another book that most people don't know about that was really great for that era was Doug Carlston wrote a book called Software People <laughs> back then that had a lot of really great luminaries in the industry as well. So there is stuff John. that was written, but they're old books. John, I have to tell you that my encounter with hackers was, it, this was in the, I had sort of just arrived at Broderbund and was meeting, you know, Doug and all these people for the first time. An advanced copy of uh, hackers arrived and Doug was reading Ooh. from it out loud and everybody was laughing. Because, <laughs> <laughs> because it was about like, Sierra no. and Orton and that. <laughs> yeah. And also because like, I mean, it, it was kind of. Uh, oh, know, he's in it. Yeah. It's, 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 yeah, and also he was like, I was th I was there. I'm not sure it happened quite that way. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that's so funny. Yeah, that must be so know, surreal yeah. for y'all. I mean, to be at a point of like, I mean, John, when you read something like Masters of Doom, is it like, well, I'm glad this history is kind of out there, even if I have arguments with a lot of chapters yeah. here? Yeah, you know, the thing about it, it was great that there's a lot of high, like the, the important beats are good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the things I thought was really great about it is just got people excited about game development. You know, like they want to go and make a game like that. They want to go and like drink Diet Coke and eat pizza all night and just make games <laughs> like Game Jam forever. Well. And and that was that was one of the one of the greatest things that I thought came out of that was just it really inspired a lot of people because I think there were a lot of relatable stories and a lot of people saw themselves in us. Like I'm like those guys. I can do that too. Um, so yeah, I think that was one of the one of the really good parts of that. John, I'm glad you mentioned Soft Talk. That magazine was so important to me. Like when I was in high school, you know, in 1981 in college, and I, you know, I wanted to make games, but I didn't really know anybody in the real game industry. I was just, you know, doing my best. Nobody did. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so reading like Soft Talk was like the only source of information about the game industry. I mean, uh, yeah. Broder, the reason that I submitted, you know, Karateka and my first games to Broderbund was because I had read, uh, you know, the Margo and Al's profile of the Carlstons in Soft Talk. And it just, oh, okay. It, you know, yeah. And it, it just uh, kind of painted a picture of what it was like, the company, the people. And the, it just, you know, there I was a kid in New York and, you know, reading about this, 
you know, company out in California. And it's just like, oh my God, I just, they sound like the most wonderful people in the world. I just want to, you know, I just want to go and like be there and be part of that. And so yeah. I, I kept that article, that issue of soft talk. And then a few years later, you know, I had my first game done and I submitted it uh, on amazing. a floppy disk, you know, first of all to Birderbund. So yeah. soft talk was, uh, it was so important. So, it was. Yeah, it I have multiple like copies both. of each issue. <laughs> <laughs> it, it does seem like both of you guys had, um, you know, the beginning of your career connected you with people who were nowhere near you. Um, and was that all just through the magazines? You were just all yeah. subscribed to the same magazines. And that's yeah, there wasn't any anywhere to go either. You can't like go somewhere and meet like there was a West Coast computer fair that happened, you know, but most people didn't know about it. The, you know, really Apple Fest, I think, in California. If you remember, you, you anyone goes to GDC. And you go in the Moscone Center, um, you know, there's North and South and you know, those buildings. Uh, Moscone South is where Apple Fest was held. Oh, fine. So in 87, that's I went cool. to Apple Fest and that's how I got my job at Origin basically was going to the Origin booth. And imagine this kid walks into a convention, goes to the Origin booth. They're displaying a rewritten Ultima 1 in assembly, and they're showing off Ultima 5 because it's in development. I went over, and I just took the disk out of one of the computers and stuck mine in and rebooted it. <laughs> 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 and the marketing director is like, what are you doing? <laughs> I said, check it out. And they're like, that looks pretty cool. Can I get your information? <laughs> and so I put their disk back in, and I got their information, and eventually yeah, I got a job a couple months later. <laughs> Jeez, How old were you? Eighteen. I was. Um, I was nineteen. Yeah. Wow. So I, I mean, do you all have advice for developers out there about just being less modest and getting a book out there? Like, how would you encourage other developers out there to get some of their history down? I, I know. I would. I would say do it. it. It doesn't matter who you are. If you've made games, write about it. There's always something to learn, but it's always like everyone has a fan, you know, like I could say the name Peter Ward and be probably none of you know who he is, but he had made some really cool Apple II games, Black Magic being like one of my favorites. And, you know, I'm a huge fan of his and I would love to read his story about how he got good enough to write that game, you know, and the games like South Pacific Quest and stuff that he wrote before that. Just there's there's always like, you know, does anyone know who the corn bugs are? It's a crazy group that Buckethead was in. And, you know, it, it, it's a nutty, nutty group the way that Primus is nutty. And I would love to, to, to read about those guys. <laughs> yeah. And I know it's kind of getting to the fleeting digital territory, but maybe people are intimidated by like, I can't write my memoirs. That's going to take years to do. Jump on for a podcast. I'll do a whole oral history series with anybody who wants to. Like, let's just try and get those stories out there instead of just ah, there's some, you know, scattered notes and then they die and then the family throws them away, which is going to be, I feel like, so much of this game industry at this point. Yeah. Yeah, basically. Yeah, I think save everything. I have at least a thousand pages worth of stuff that I've done back when I was a teen and making you know, all computer clubs and drawings and, you know, notes for games and all that stuff. And I kept them all because someday they're going to go somewhere. I mean, <laughs> would you ever consider the, the digital eclipse treatment for your history as much as we can? Sure. You know, I, I remember giving Jason Scott um, all of my Apple II games that I made because uh, I digitally, like, <laughs> in 1997, I decided like on a weekend, I was like, I need to get all my stuff off my Apple II discs because they're old. Yeah. This is 97. And it, what, yeah, what if they don't work again? And I had an Apple II and I had my PC and I'm like, there's nothing that I have here to, to do this. So I, I found a serial cable that would plug into both of them. Uh, and then I basically wrote code for both computers to take a take a shrink it version of the disk and then transmit it over to the PC and then decode it back into an image that worked directly in an emulator at the time uh, win win Apple and uh, and I just did this on a, on a Saturday it took me 11 hours to write it and then I just archived all of my stuff on the next day and I've had it ever since 
that day, 1997. Yeah. So everything I wrote from on disk 1982 when I had my first computer from April, um, all the way all the way till through the entire you know decade, um, all of the games I wrote on the Apple II are all archived. And it was just a slightly motivated weekend to make that happen. Like that's you just need that yeah. extra push for the <laughs> Sega history, everybody. Jordan, do you have a do you have great losses of your history? Things that you regret not saving, being more focused on. Well, for a long time, I thought that I had lost uh, the Prince of Persia so- source code. Mm. You know, I had a, I had a shoebox full of like all the important floppy disks from that era that I'd saved, and it was just sort of in my closet, gathering dust year after year. And uh, I was in the back, and I was like, I should do what John just described. You know, take the data off of those, <laughs> you know, Apple disks while they were still readable. Like the final version of Prince of Persia this, with the source code, the assembly code for the game. I knew that I had archived it at the end of that development, but for some reason, like that, those discs were gone. I, they just were not in the shoebox. They were. I searched for them. I couldn't find them for twenty years. I regretted. I can't believe it. Like I spent three years making Prince of Persia, and it's and I just don't have a copy of the yeah. source code anywhere. And of course, Broderbund didn't have a copy. Like you know, in those days, ah. publishers, like even if they were still around, like there was no way a publisher would have like anything from the games that they had published. Like it, it's really yeah. the only time anything was ever survived was if the uh, developer, the author, you know, the programmer took it home and kept it for some reason yeah. like for the next few decades. Or gave them so, the source code for no reason. <laughs> yeah. Because there was no commercial so, so, reason to keep it at the time, right? I mean, there yeah. wasn't like a such and, thing as a remake. So why, why, yeah, the project's fire, done. Yeah. Why do you need it anymore? Yeah. My dad actually found a box in his closet in New York and it has a bunch of my old stuff. And he sent it to me just because he was cleaning out his closets. And it was like 20 copies of Spanish, the Spanish edition of Prince of Persia, like Amstrad or something. Oh, wow. And, wow. and so I was like, okay, well, whatever. It's just, I don't need 20 copies of Amstrad Prince of Persia. But then in there, there was a little three and a half inch plastic box. And in there was the Ooh. source code for Prince of Persia, wow. the copy that I had saved. Whoa. So. Thank God. <laughs> yeah, so Amazing. I called, uh, yeah, uh, Jason Scott, who, John mentioned and uh, Tony Diaz, the late, late Tony Diaz, like, drove to my house in, in LA with a truckload of old, you know, Apple IIs and all of the cables needed to do what you know John oh. you know, spent eleven hours doing himself <laughs> and uh, hooked it all up and like extracted the the code and uploaded it to GitHub, you know, where it is to this day. So that was that's lost, amazing. You know, lost and found. Yeah. So uh, yeah. Doom Doom has been open source since like. 1997 97. or something. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah and the then, one. so is, is Prince of Persia open source then too following that? Well, or it's is, just an archival uh, object, you know, it's... It's on Git, GitHub. The, so, yeah, the source could, yeah, is yeah, on Git. Okay. Yeah. yeah I, I, mean, I mean, people can look at it, but it's really, I think, a, more an object of you historical can't use study. It. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, I mean, it, it, people have used it in crazy ways. Like they've, uh, you know, someone ported <laughs> it to the Commodore 64. Wow. You know, recently, like just you know, as a challenge, you know, and people like wow. to take it apart and see how things were done back in the day. So, I mean, I'm glad that it's there and that people are looking at it and enjoying it you know, and learning from it, but it's not really useful per se, you know, unless you want. Well, I, I, I guess that's know. my point is why, why don't, why do you think more people don't do that? Because I mean, there's not much commercial that like, you, you know, no one's stealing your Prince of Persia secrets, your doom secrets at this point, right? Um, yeah. Those aren't particularly useful in today's gaming landscape. But why do you think that more creators don't do that? Oh, a lot of them threw it away. Well, <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> Which is the big problem. They do. They just like, you know, they move on to the next thing. I don't know why I decided to save everything at all. <laughs> I have no reason other than I kind of felt value that I made something and why would I throw that in the trash? Like, let me just keep it. And I'll be able, maybe like I'm hoarding, you know, my artifacts or something, but I did. I just, for some reason, kept everything. I mean, like you won't, the stuff that I have, I, there are things I have that I need to give to a museum like Bob Bishop, everything Bob Bishop has done. I have everything that of his Bob Bishop is like a really early pioneer in the game dev, like 77. And, um, I have, I have everything I've un I've unopened mail of his, I have so much of his stuff. Um, and you know, he was super critical at the beginning of Apple's history. Um, I have stuff from Silas Warner, the guy who made castle Wolfenstein. I got all his stuff when, when he died, his, his widow gave me everything. Um, 
I have NAS search abilities, you know, I have an Apple II, and I have the entire Final Fantasy 1, 2, and 3 NES dev kit that he used to write those games and the computer he wrote it on. And I have the Super Nintendo hardware debugger that he used to create Secret of Mana. And I have all that. I have it. I have a lot more than that. <laughs> that's absurd. I mean, so that's the thing is that's great. But what, is there a plan in place to getting that into some museum somewhere? Does your will just say, I don't know, Strong Museum, take it all? Yeah, we're going to we're going to get basically an archivist to go through everything to catalog it all. It's just the thousands of things. You know, it's there's there's whole rooms dedicated to just all the stuff that I have. Um, it's nuts. Like Steve Wozniak made 30 Apple glasses back in the late, maybe 1980 or 79. It's the Apple logo, the multicolor one. Yeah. And he made sunglasses, these cool glasses with this multicolor thing, he made 30 copies of those. And I have one of them that hasn't really been worn <laughs> oh, in awesome. perfect condition. Uh, things like that. Lots of artifacts. <laughs> Right, right. And so are both of you all like, I don't know, maybe more nostalgic people? Are you hell bent on preserving family archives as well? Or is it just this weird niche of passion for your own careers that you feel like we need to hoard, we need to save, we need to preserve? I, I think, yeah, definitely uh, family too. Yeah. 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 I, I feel like it's almost like a family obligation to, yeah, kind of yeah, to tell, hand it tell down. what we've lived, tell our story, yeah, pass it on. I mean, with the replay, which is, of course, it's a graphic novel. So I was collecting like not just the stories, but also needed visual references like to what all these things looked like so I could draw them, you know, and for the part, and you know, it's a it's a sort of a multi-generational family memoir. So I'm telling my story about making games in the 80s. And so I needed to draw the Apple II and like what the inside of the Broderbund office looked like, you know, and, uh, you know, that's what amazing. movie posters I yeah. had on the wall. And so th that's where it's like. I'm grateful to have these online archives. So it's like, I remember what movie poster I had on the wall when I was doing Prince of Persia in 1988, but you know, where can I find a reference for that poster? Well, somebody, some movie buff has, has that poster, like the original 1977 theatrical poster and they've scanned it and I can just go online and in 10 seconds, I can find it so I could draw it you know, nice. in the book. That was great. But the, for the family part, you know, my grandfather who was, uh, who arrived in the U S as a refugee from, uh, you know, from the Nazis in, in uh, World War II, he came, sort of arrived, you know, with a, like he had kept fo some photos and documents, like, but it was really all he had of that sort of that chapter of the family's life that had like, you know, like many refugees who have to flee their country, like everything is gone. So it's only what you can yeah. carry in a suitcase. So I think probably for that reason, like I sort of grew up with the feeling that the family, you know, those few old black and white family photos you know, and documents and letters that he kept, you know, and then sort of gave, you know, passed down were precious. And, uh, yeah. And, and that the family history was something that like, if, you know, if I didn't do my part to preserve it, then it would, uh, be gone. I think that was sort of probably implanted in me subconsciously. So it just became natural when I started making games, you know, well, first keeping a journal, but also when I was done with the project, like, as John said, you've got a bunch of sketches and, you know, old discs and stuff. Like, it's easy to just toss that stuff. Great, that project's done. Toss it and move on. Or, you know, the, the impulse that I think we both have yeah. is to just, okay, put that folder, yeah, in another folder and put it in a box. And so that 20 years later, you've got all that stuff sitting in the garage somewhere. I have uh, this thing called an applesauce, which is a hardware box that can connect to my Mac. And I can read any Apple II discs, I, you know, even five and a quarters. So I can basically hook up Apple II disk drives into this thing and just read them straight into a Mac and uh, it'll save them out. You know, emulators can just start using them immediately. Really, really cool stuff. So preserving stuff nowadays is so much easier than it was back in you know the early days. Did you foresee, John, that there were going to be emulators for all of those machines? No way. <laughs> <laughs> like that was like 
you know, that was like the, the latest badass chips and horsepower and everything. It's like nothing could get better than this instead of like your phone could like run anything. I have Secret of Mana through, you know, on my phone since <laughs> right. I since Apple has allowed emulators now. Yeah. Just like some, a month ago or something. Um, so, yeah, I have all kinds of stuff on my phone now. I think I installed Windows on it. <laughs> Windows, X, Windows XP. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, do you all have thoughts on uh, the Nintendo Museum? I don't know if you watched that video of them revealing what they're building out there in Kyoto. No, I don't. But I, I don't. if it's is it is it backed by Nintendo? Yeah, they're doing it. I don't know, Kelsey, I don't oh know if you have more thoughts on this. But. Amazing. It'll be perfect. Well, it'll be yeah. the best archive of Nintendo stuff. I, <laughs> well, I would hope. here's hoping. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I'm. I'm I'm always thankful when a company wants to put in the uh, work and effort and, and, you know, financial backing to do anything preservation wise with their own history. Um, I, we have yet to see, I think, um, you know, some of the more contextual stuff we were talking about earlier. I think a lot of it is like, here's all the products we made, which is great. And I think that it's important, you know, not a lot of people know, you might know like Nintendo made playing cards, but you might not know they made a baby stroller and like, you know, the, Get a bunch of little board games and stuff in the 60s or they worked with Disney for a while in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I mean, those things I think are very cool. Um, but uh, I, you know, I, I do think that there's still I think I think at the end of the day, it's just always going to be up to the individuals to make sure that that context is provided somewhere. Um, yeah. I I think companies, you know, I think they they can do their best and they'll sometimes even do a really good job of sharing that stuff. But uh, just making sure that all of those other things are preserved, the the thoughts and memories and, um, you know, the the journals you kept and the fan letters you kept and all of that stuff. I mean, that yeah. that I think tends to always fall on the creators well, it, and on the fans, it, unfortunately. It takes time to like do this, right? So the yeah. best way that I'm going to be able to like archive my games is to talk about each one individually, break down any technical information that I can, and then just talk about what was going through my head when I was making it yeah. and include drawings and all that. So I have a site, uh, R-O-M-E.R-O, uh, for my last name, and there's a, I think there's Arcade or something on there. Um, and that basically is like, the start of the process it's definitely not done because there's a it made a lot of games um let me see is it not oh it, let me see if it were on the game stop uh, take it run. down oh it's it's not up right now because of um some domain shenanigans but um <laughs> basically i did i have several games where i have like a video of it playing it's a downloadable apple II image for an emulator awesome. and i just talk about this was my first game where I did this and I'd go through a whole write up of you know scrolling and the things I drew and why I was doing it and how I was inspired by this game you know like I love Threshold by Sierra and you know I, I wanted which asked was a copy of Astro Blaster and uh, it you know like what I what I did and you know and I have a video where I'm talking about it while it's running and all that stuff and like it's really the best way that you're going to get full like recall of someone's stuff. Yeah. Is to go and I have good news for you. The director's commentary. Yeah. I have good news for you. It is on the Wayback Machine on the Internet yeah. Archive. So even Thank if your you domain right. shenanigans don't get figured out, we still yeah, at right. least have a lot of this work that you put into have it. You, here's, here's, so this is like, that's just me talking about my own stuff. Um, big things that have been created like the Macintosh computer like the creation of the mac when it came out in 1984 had been in, has been in development for years right there's a site i think andy Hertzfeld created it yep, it's called yep. folklore.org and it is the the development in all aspects from all kinds of people that worked at apple at that time their own stories and he wrote all the all the software for that site personally so it's not off the shelf anything he wrote it and it's been running for decades, this site. And so if anyone was back there in Bandley Drive or at any of those um, Apple locations in development, they'll put any recollection of the history of the creation of the Mac in, in there. And there'll be comments from people back then that, that worked there. And uh, it's a really great site if you care about, you know, 
hardware history, the creation of something like that. Yeah. Oh, that's perfect. Jordan, I have a dumb question for you. Um, are you just in the interest of preserving as much of your history as you can as you go along? Or have you had like key moments in your career where you were able to consciously think, this is a historical moment. I need to absorb everything right now. No, absolutely not. I mean, I've always been focused on the thing that we were making when we were making it and having to ship it. And then the next thing and the other projects going on, it was really just kind of clear the desk and like take the stuff from the thing that we just finished and just, you know, I didn't know if I was ever going to look at it again or when Yeah, there was really no plan. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of in the mood now because of having spent three years, you know, writing and drawing this memoir, Replay, right. which was kind of a reason to go back and sort of try, well, and also to talk to people, you know, from, you know, that I'd worked with and friends and family and sort of ask them all to tell their stories and a reason to also sort of look for the visual references, you know, and any old photos or video and look at the old games and so forth. But it was really for that project, you know, it was to get the book done. And again, now that that book has, you know, been published and I'm working on other projects now, it's, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm really always focused on the thing that I'm doing now. It's, I think it's, but again, so many of the things that I've done have a historical subject, right? From whether it's games like The Last Express that were, you know, I mean, it's fiction, but it's recreating the events of 1914, you know, on the Orient Express or even Prince of Persia, which is, yeah, really fiction and fantasy, but again, it, like it's all often been the occasion to go back and do historical research and, uh, you know, sort of try to see what this, uh, well, you know, what the world of the game looked like to base it on on real references. So I, I'm, I'm always digging into archives and uh, kind of accumulating archives. So yeah. I think maybe that's just part of the flavor, uh, you know, that, you know, my working day usually has. Yeah. How do you release stuff? and preserve history by releasing stuff without pissing too many people off. Um, I mean, there's the whole legal conundrum, right? But like, Jordan, I've done I mean, that. <laughs> okay, all right, maybe that's the route. You just have to say, F it, let's do it. But like, Jordan, I mean, your perspective on that Prince of Persia movie from Disney must be fascinating. But it's like, what are you going to do? Just release all of the emails you have from that era? Like, like, I don't know if that's a specific test case, but like, how do you handle that type of thing? Well, the strong is very understanding about this stuff because I'll, they were happy to take everything in my garage. I, I don't know how it was for you, John, but they said, look, if there's, if there are any boxes in here that you're not sure about, you know, we can seal it. So I'll like for the making of certain games, you know, which I know it can, it contains, uh, you know, contracts and like arguments and right. uh, you know, maybe flame mails and things that would hurt people's feelings <laughs> if they got ready. Just say, okay, so open this one, just hold it for like 40 years. <laughs> I figure, you know, yeah. 40 years from now, it's like, I've if seen some cares, open when I'm know. dead stuff yeah. uh, at the strong. Yeah. 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 They actually have, they actually have that stipulation. You can, you can say when you want that thing to be accessible. That's so and It doesn't necessarily mean yeah. that there's something bad in there. It just means, okay, there's, I don't want to be, I don't want to be around letters in here. <laughs> yeah. This and I don't have time to read it now. So like, I don't even know what's in there, but better safe than sorry. Right. <laughs> yeah. And John, your strategy is, uh, just, you're going to step on some toes naturally trying to save this stuff? I Well, the funny thing, um, 10 years ago, I basically released a bunch of unreleased Doom stuff from the actual development of Doom. So when we were developing Doom, we had a NetWare 3.11 drive that had you know all the folders of just like the chaos of creating a game. And I have a CD burn of that whole archive of the creation of doom not the cleaned up 1997 you know linux version of the source that was handed out this is what we this is everything we did and um and so all the unused stuff i basically took a bunch of i think it was art and well yeah it was a bunch of the art sorry it's just the art and i put it out there and it basically was just like don't do that again <laughs> and and it recently um, just put out um, in their Doom collection all of that unused and the rest of the stuff I didn't release. They put all of it out there, which is really great. And also 10 years ago, I put all of the Quake map sources out there. I uploaded them onto my site. 
And uh, and so they they were okay with that because I asked them, "Are you cool with me putting this out there?" Because I have all of it, they didn't. Right. And so they were just like, "Okay, yeah, that's no problem." Um, so I did. Now that's like nobody can like game. Daikatana's Game Boy Color version was actually a good game. It was like a it was like Legend of Zelda type thing. And so I I uploaded that on my site for people to just download because you just can't find it now. Yeah, I didn't even know that that existed. <laughs> That's why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's actually it's actually good. <laughs> wow, and that was a, a team like those you were it was working in Japan. on that as well. Oh, okay. It was a team in Japan making the the a complete recreation of the storyline, but in Legend of Zelda overhead format. And I I took their English translation as well, cleaned that all up. I told him what what how how I wanted it in, implemented, and then I cleaned up all the English on it, and then they put it out. But they they um, it's really really hard to find, especially the manual. People are dying to get a copy of that manual in uh-huh. any form. Weird. So, so I need to go get. I have to dig it out of my archive and scan the manual and put it up there. So what's the the takeaway for all this stuff when it comes to? Interacting with companies, trying to get this stuff out there, just push a little bit harder and ask for forgiveness. I'd say, you know, it's funny. Uh, like in my case, I have a lot of stuff that the company didn't have. And I actually was giving them like, are you guys going to do anything with a re-release of Commander Keen? Because here's all the source code for all of the Commander Keens. Right. Um, that kind of thing. Because they were asking me for it, they, you know, because they just didn't have anything. They didn't keep anything. I did. So, um, so I gave this stuff back to them so they could actually, you know, do something with it. Um, at least own the stuff that they made or we made that they own now. Um, but things like, you know, things that were, uh, let's like say Daikatana, which was owned by IDOS, sold, bought by Square Enix, Square Enix bought by Embracer. And so it's lost somewhere. Um, I, over 10 years ago, took all of the Daikatana source code and gave it to a group that has made the fix for Daikatana. It's like, version 1.3 and it fixes everything that was ever wrong with the game and so people can play it <laughs> the way it was like meant to meant to come out yeah um and they were dedicated you know asking questions and stuff for 10 years working on that patch and they finally got it out there and uh, but all that source code i kept the whole source code the, the entire drive again i kept all of that that's so awesome. Just to add to that, I know there are companies out, companies right now that are doing that. I know EA's archive team has started reaching out to older developers and being like, hey, you're not in trouble, but can we have yeah. this? Because we don't have it anymore. <laughs> really? Um, and no yeah, if, if you don't, I mean, if there's not someone That's there cool. putting it on their own back to save it, I mean, these things really do disappear. And I think that that's, um, you know, it just highlights the importance of even if, honestly, even if you don't have a plan for releasing it right away, I mean, John, you've clearly just been, you, you've been amassing all of this stuff and we know that you've got a good plan for it and it's okay <laughs> that, you know, I'm sure some people are going to scream and be like, release it, release it. But, <laughs> you know, I, I think it's the first part, the first most important part is that there's someone that holds taking it. ownership of it and actually <laughs> yeah. making copies and actually figuring out, you know, saving it from the trash. And so even if you're if you're a developer and you're scared of your company's legal team and you don't, you know, want to rock too many boats right now, that's fine. Just don't let it disappear. <laughs> you can figure just, it out well, later. Just copy it and then the company goes away and then no one can come after you. <laughs> <laughs> We're familiar with I mean, that. Right? That's yeah. kind of uh that's kind of an irony of, of this and it's I think been this way for a long time, which is a lot of the things that we have, things that have been saved, were saved by people who technically didn't really have the permission or the authority to save those things. And they would have gotten in trouble, you know, had it been known. It's not for them. Enough time went by that now we're just so happy that it was saved. Yeah. Yeah. I Uh, think that happens over and over again. Kelsey, I don't want to freak you out or freak anybody out too much, but, uh, this is okay. This is a weird personal story, but um, like when my grandma was getting up there, um, I made a point of like going through all of her photo albums with her and secretly recording her history just on my phone, you know, just the audio of her yeah. walking through all this stuff. And I was so proud of it. I was like, oh, this is so cool to have this all preserved. And then at her funeral, I had like a laptop with the photo albums and like could let people like choose to play these and like leaf along with them. Wow. And it, nobody interested. Wow. You know, it's like, eh, whatever. And it kind of, it just, I'm not, this isn't an attack wow. on my family, but it was just this overall feeling of like, 
are we just so scared of our own deaths that we're desperate to preserve all these things, but ultimately it will not matter at all? I mean, obviously the sun's going to explode, all that fun stuff, but like really what are we <laughs> saving all this stuff for? Just for a researcher 40 years from now to have a slightly better paper? For your kids. Well, for the kids, okay. Yeah. A slightly yeah. better paper? They can't write a paper at all if it's not there. <laughs> I mean, exactly. I, look, I, I mean, I, you... The nihilism is a take for sure. I'm I just mean, asking. You can just say nothing matters, and we're all going to turn into space dust eventually. Like okay. that's, that's factually true. <laughs> but um, I think you know we live in a much richer world that improves in you know more substantial ways when we understand our past and we can we can learn. And even if sometimes like I, I'm not going to go make doom, but I still enjoy reading your story, John, and I still learn <laughs> things from it. You know, like I don't think it has to be a practical one to one. Uh, you know, application like this is how he made yeah. the games, so this is how I'm going to make the games. I think we oh, just right. kind of, yeah. you know, we we become uh, a richer society for understanding how things made it onto shelves, and not just, you know, uh, when we don't understand how the how the beef got to the supermarket. Yeah, well, it's also <laughs> it's also meaning, you know? <laughs> people are excited reading about it too. They read it. Yeah. They like I'm, I have the emails from people saying they're crying when they're reading the book. Then oh. they're super energized and, and excited when they get to another part. And just like, you know, it really affects people. Like lots of people are affected in completely different ways and you have no idea how. But the fact that it's out there means they can be affected. Yeah. Ben, I think, you know, what you said, like, it's not that the everything that ever happened is important and needs to be saved for all time. But anything could be important to somebody at some point. And so if they if they can find it when they need it, like, you know, like maybe that photo album, maybe that that gathering wasn't the day that people wanted to see it. But, right. you know, as I said, the, 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 the kids or the grandchildren at a certain point wondering, you know, who was she when they could discover this and this could be incredibly valuable to them, you know, at that moment. And the same, like we're at the, the age now where, you know, people ha who grew up playing games have memories of the games that they played in their childhood. You know, people who've made their career in game development remember the first games that they discovered that got them onto that path. So those things, I mean, they're sentimental, but they, they're also meaningful. Like the, the details, like there's inspiration, there's lessons learned and it's incredibly relevant and, and, now that the generation that grew up playing, you know, those, you know, those first early games are now of an age to kind of look back at it. And that's something that's part of the story of their own lives and, and they're of an age to appreciate it. So like we couldn't have, you know, back when we were 17, 18, 19 years old, we weren't thinking that way. No. But, you know, 50 years <laughs> later, you know, you're not 17 anymore. And there's other yeah. people who were, you know, were little kids then. And now, for, you know, for them, it's part of their story. I get, so I, think, I get I emails really from stuff. little kids yeah. today, you know, that are yeah. that are all excited about old games that they played that that I made, and it yeah. makes them want to to make them, you know. It isn't the most amazing thing to hear from people who have shared those games with their kids or, their, or grandchildren, so that it becomes oh, like man. a multi generational thing. Yeah, I the, I'm, I'm just incredibly lucky to be able to hear so many people's stories because I go speak at lots of conferences all around the world. Lots of them are just technology conferences. And the reason why a game guy goes to technology conferences is because those people got into tech because of games. And so I'll be like the very different speaker compared to the all the, the Java technology guys and all the, the Rust programmers and stuff. And when I go to this one called We Are Developers, which is now based in Berlin, they have about 12,000, 15,000 people at the conference. And when I go there um, and I go speak, I also play deathmatch, but I also have a lot, I have a, like a merch table with posters and, you know, all kinds of stuff for people to buy. And the line is three hours long. And every one of those people has a story and how they played with their dad and their dad's not with them anymore, but they just remember the times that, that they had together playing Doom and sitting on his lap and just, you know, just so many stories that people have of playing these games and how it, like, emails I get on a daily basis, just like the only reason I'm sane during this time in my life was I was playing Doom all the time and it got me out of what was, what was happening in the real world. And uh, so games are massively effective and those people like to also make a personal connection with the person that made the thing that affected them or helped them. So, um, yeah, that's all part of the history, too. It's just like 
getting all of that information from people. Yeah. Okay. So takeaways, support the internet archive, whoever you can. That seems <laughs> yes, like an yes. important one. Kelsey, other takeaways we got here? I mean, save your stuff. Save your I stuff. think it's just the biggest, the biggest one, even if you don't have a plan for it. And I, I empathize with that completely, but make sure you're saving it because, uh, you know, you don't know what's going to end up being important. And you, yeah. yeah, you might end up saving some stuff that doesn't find an audience, but you almost certainly will be surprised by something that does. No matter who you are, save your stuff, you know, <laughs> because someday you might make something really cool and now everyone wants to know everything about what you've done. Yep. Yep. <laughs> absolutely. Jordan, final thoughts here, man. Oh, it's a. Uh... It's been great talking about this stuff with you guys. It's uh, I th we're really in a great time now when so many people are like putting like love and time and effort into archiving stuff and making it findable and sharing like you know what they know. It's uh, I mean there was there was no internet when we were starting out, but man, if there had been, like what what oh, a man. wealth of, of stuff is there to be shared and found. Yeah, yep. absolutely. Right on. Well, hey, uh, if you want to learn more about Jordan's story, you can check out Replay, Memoir of an Uprooted Family, or for John's story, Doom Guy, Life in First Person. They're doing their part. Now other developers, step up out there. Get that stuff on paper. Get it recorded. Get it into the world, please. But hey, John, Jordan, Kelsey, thank you so much for being here, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, it's thank been a you. pleasure. And thank you so much for watching or listening to this interview from interview from MinMax. We have plenty more interviews on our channel. You can always subscribe to help support independent games media directly. Check out the playlist. There's a ton more in there. Making their own little bit of gaming history and trying to preserve as much as we can here. So we appreciate the support. All right, thanks so much, everybody. Bye. If you thought, hey, this video wasn't bad. Well, there's a whole lot more like it on MinMax's YouTube channel. Please help us out by subscribing to our channel and checking out the MinMax Show podcast, also available on your favorite podcast app, the best, most thorough discussion about games on the internet with the deepest dive, our monthly community trivia show with prizes called Trivia Tower, and a whole lot more. Thanks so much for your support, everybody. All you gotta do is click that subscribe button. We'd really appreciate it.